God's persistent love. No matter how sinful and rebellious people become, we are to continue to communicate the message of God's grace and forgiveness. Here now is Gene Getz. This principle emerges right from the very beginning of 2 Kings. So let's uh, look at the text. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 1, uh, beginning with verse 1. Notice that this whole section is called Ahaziah's Sickness and Death. And it reads, After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. Now if you look at 1 Kings, you will have a great section on Ahab, and when you really meet Ahab in a very interesting and dynamic way is when Elijah, the Tishbite, the prophet of the Lord, went into Ahab and said, it's not going to rain in Israel for several years. And we know that three and a half years went by before it rained. And this was God's judgment on Israel because of their sin. Ahab was a very wicked king. In fact, the Scriptures say that he was more evil than anyone before him, uh, speaking of the other kings of Israel. And of course, uh, one of the uh, things that happened in his life that led him even into a greater downward spiral into sin and evil and idolatry was when he married Jezebel. And any time you think of Jezebel, you think of evil, you think of wickedness. And she had a very, very profound impact on Ahab. In many respects, Ahab was a very weak person, and Jezebel was very strong. And of course, we have that incredible confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel. And, and the Lord revealed Himself in a very dramatic way to, to all of Israel. And so, Basically, uh, 2 Kings picks up with the continuity. Uh, we read, After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice window of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers instructing them, Go inquire of Baalzebub. And there we have a form of Baal worship. Ahab was a worshiper of Baal. Uh, Jezebel was a worshiper of Baal. And the false gods, of course, that grew out of the uh, worship of Baal, many different gods. Here is Baalzebub. Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, if I will recover from this injury. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah is still on the scene. And the angel of the Lord, the interesting thing is, in the Old Testament, is when you see uh, that adjective, the, or that definition of who this angel is, generally when you see the angel of the Lord, it's a reference to an Old Testament manifestation of Jesus Christ. So he's really encountering Jesus Christ, who, by the way, always existed before he became a man and took on flesh. And so here is this manifestation of Jesus Christ. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, revealing himself now to Elijah, go and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria. And where are they going? They're going to inquire of this false god. Go and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? That's a, a rhetorical question with an obvious answer. Do you really believe in your heart that the God in Israel doesn't exist? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You will not get up from your sick bed. You will certainly die. And Elijah left. Now, basically, these messengers went and gave the king the message. Did he respond? Well, he asked who this old man was. They described him. And he said, well, that's Elijah. 
Now he knew, and there's no question, he knew all about that great battle there on Mount Carmel, that great demonstration of God's power, when all the prophets of Baal were slaughtered, and God revealed Himself through fire, and came down and not only destroyed the offering that Elijah had put on this uh, altar, but all the water that was in the trenches, and the rocks, and the stones. He knew all about that. Well, here he's getting a message from Elijah the Tishbite. What does he do? Does he respond? Not at all. Not positively. We read on in verses 9 through 10. So King Ahaziah sent a captain of 50 with his 50 men to Elijah. You know, in some respects, thinking with 50 men he can be victorious over God <laughs> because of what God has already done through this man. When the captain went up to him, he was sitting on top of the hill. He announced, Man of God, the king declares, come down. And that had to be somewhat tongue-in-cheek, maybe actually an affront, as it were, to Elijah, when he calls him the man of God. And Elijah picked up on that because he responded to the captain of the fifty. If I am a man of God, as you just said I am, if I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. And then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty men. Now, there's a very direct correlation between fire coming down from heaven and the fire that came down and destroyed the altar up on Mount Carmel. God is sending Ahaziah a message. I am God. And God is also sending a message, don't make fun of Elijah, my prophet, by taunting him and calling him a man of God. He is a man of God, and once again I'm going to prove it. But behind that proof is not just God's anger, but God is reaching out in love and grace, because this happened three times. Following this passage, we see that the messengers go, or they, they get the report, ba basically what happened. And so he sends 50 more, and the same thing happens a second time. And then he sends them a third time. But this time, Jesus Christ in the Old Testament steps in and gives Elijah a message. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Don't be afraid of him. So he got up and he went down with him to the king. And then Elijah said to King Ahaziah, This is what the Lord says. This is not what I say. I'm just a mouthpiece, just a spokesman. This is what the Lord says. Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there's no god in Israel? For you to inquire of His will, you will not get up from your sick bed. This is it. You will not get up from your sick bed. You will certainly die. And it happened. Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. And since he had no son, Joram became king in his place. And this happened in the second year of Judah's king Jehoram son of Jehoshaphat. And remember now that there are two nations side by side here. There is Israel, the ten tribes, and Ahaziah was the king, and Ahab was the king of these ten tribes, whereas Jehoshaphat was the king of the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And so you see the division here uh, in this situation. Now, when you look at this, this passage, and you look at what God is doing here, once again, in the Old Testament, we see God's persistent love. Even though we see God's wrath and judgment on sin, we see God being patient. God is giving him an opportunity to repent. He's giving him these manifestations of power. Three times he gave him an opportunity 
to repent. He even had an opportunity to repent when uh, Elijah stood there and pronounced this judgment. But he didn't, and he suffered the consequences. And when we go to the New Testament, we see God's patience operative even to this very day. 2 Peter chapter 3. Dear friends, don't let this one thing escape you. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like one day. With God, time is without beginning, without end. Time begins and time ends, but not with God. And so Peter goes on to say, The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you. There's the key. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. And that included Ahaziah and Ahab and all the wicked people who gave themselves over to idolatry within Israel as well as within the Gentile world. God is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. It's God's will that all come to repentance. We know from Scripture, obviously, that that's not going to happen. But the fact of the matter is, that's God's will. That's God's patience, His persistent love. And we see it illustrated here in the Old Testament. In the reflection and response question, uh, I take you really once again back to an Old Testament story. But here's the question. How does this story of Ahaziah compare with God's love and grace when the children of Israel marched around the city of Jericho? You remember that story? This is when they first came into the Promised Land. This is after they had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of their disobedience. God miraculously parted the Jordan River, took them all across, and uh, once they got across, uh, they began to take over the land. One of the cities, one of the city-states that they were to take over was Jericho, which was just basically across the river. And this is what we read, and notice the correlation here with what happened with Ahaziah and the message of Elijah, really the message of God through Elijah. We read, Now Jericho was strongly fortified because of the Israelites, no one leaving or entering the city. They knew they were coming. And the Lord said to Joshua, Look, I have handed Jericho, its king, and its fighting men over to you. And then he gives Joshua some very strange instructions. March around the city with all the men of war within Israel, circling the city one time. Do this for six days. Now, why six days? Well, if you understand God's grace and love in the Old Testament, He is still reaching out to those inhabitants of Jericho who are rejecting Him, even though they were rejecting everything they knew about Israel and what God had done for them. He's giving them six days. And then He says, have seven priests carry seven ram's horn trumpets in front of the ark. But then God also said, on the seventh day, march around the city seven times. Seven times on the seventh day, while the priests, this time, blow the trumpets. They're blowing the trumpets. And when there is a prolonged blast of the horn and you hear its sound, have all the people give a mighty shout, and then the city wall will collapse, the people will advance, each man straight ahead. Now what's happening here? This is God's grace in the Old Testament. One day, two days, three days, four, five, six, seven times on the seventh day. Judgment is coming, but God in His patience is giving them an opportunity to repent. Rather, they look over the wall, they harden their hearts, and they try to stand against the God who parted the Red Sea, who parted the Jordan, who obviously was with the children of Israel in a miraculous, supernatural way. They rejected all of this knowledge in their evil and in their wickedness.